Okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is Sneakers Corner, and with me is Reason Dancers. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the early church fathers, sometimes referred to as the apostolic fathers. These are the earliest people we have after the apostles that tell us about life in the early days of the church. So to get us started, really, before we get into the into the discussion, I'd like to start with a prayer. Um, there's a cat in the background. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 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 So I'll hand it over to you if you'd like to introduce a couple of quotes. Yeah, whenever I give a, a talk, I like to introduce it with, with a couple quotes from the opposition, so to speak, just to set the mood. So today we're looking at the divinity of Christ in the Church Fathers. There's this common idea going around on the internet especially that uh, it was a late development that originally jesus was not seen as divine and this was added later on so the first quote comes from uh, da vinci code by dan brown of course it's a work of fiction but it reflects a common attitude that i've seen in numerous quotes and rather than quote some random conspiracy theorist i thought uh, go with dan brown right t bang said jesus's establishment as the son of god was officially proposed and voted on by the council of nicaea hold on you're saying jesus's divinity was the result of a vote a relatively close vote at that t being added nonetheless establishing christ's divinity was crucial to the further unification of the roman empire and to the new vatican power base by officially endorsing jesus as the son of god constantine turned jesus into a deity who existed beyond the scope of the human world, an entity whose power was unchangeable. Uh, slightly, well, considerably more serious quote from Bart Ehrman uh, in his book, How Jesus Became God. I would argue that Jesus has always been recontextualized by people living in different times and places. The first followers of Jesus did this after they came to believe that he had been raised from the dead and exalted to heaven. They made him into something he had not been before and understood him in a light of their new situation. So did the later authors of the New Testament who recontextualized and understood Jesus in light of their own, now even more different situation. So too did the Christians of the second and third centuries who understood Jesus less as a apocalyptic prophet and more as a divine being become human. So did the Christians of the fourth century who maintained that he had always existed and had always been equal with God the Father in status, authority, and power. And so do, so too do Christians today who think that the divine Christ they believe in and profess is identical in every respect with the person who is walking the dusty lanes of Galilee. So a couple things here. Uh, everyone we're going to be looking at today is the first, second, and at latest early third century. Ehrman saying that it, Christ's divinity wasn't fully established and no precise terms until the the fourth century i think uh, i oh, sorry to interrupt you but i think if we were to kind of refer to one one other area is is muslims routinely deny the divinity of jesus and they the big claim that they make is that the bible was corrupted or or at least misinterpreted you know even if even if they accept the bible that we have they would say we're we're, we're taking the wrong end of the stick and uh, by looking at the earliest Christians and what they actually believed, we can we can actually see if we we are interpreting it the way they would have in the early days. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, Ehrman's putting it in more serious, scholarly sounding terms, and he's not attributing it to you know one person, but he's essentially saying the same thing that Jesus wasn't divine. It, no one believed he was divine, and then it developed over time. It wasn't one person from on high demanding it, but same idea. It didn't develop until the fourth century. Okay. 
There is a book that I read recently uh, by David Bevan. Um, it, it was called New Light on the Difficult Words of Jesus, Insights from His Jewish Context. And the interesting thing he explains in that book is that the apostles would have been um, mentored by Jesus and they would have spent several years around him in imbuing all his instructions, his insights and so on. And the same process would have happened among the apostles with their disciples. So as we look at these uh, um, apostolic fathers, the key thing is they would have learned directly from Jesus's apostles. And I think that's a really important thing. These are not just disconnected from the, the you know, the first apostles of Jesus, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I think it would be beneficial to most Christians to have a greater appreciation of the early church fathers, the early leaders of the church. Of course, the Bible is our authority, but, you know, it's one thing to say, stand here in the 21st century and be like, oh, I, I know exactly what this means. Or we can refer to people who are a lot closer in, in culture and time and see what they had to say. And rather than just reading our personal opinions into the text, uh, this is a good way to make sure that we're, what we're deriving from the text is actually there. And also, if, if we think about what John says at the end of his gospel, he said that if we were to record everything that Jesus said and did, all the books in the world couldn't fit it. So there's obviously, there's a, there's a bigger picture contained within the early believers that we, we're not ex able to access, apart from these early documents, which give us, you know, really interesting insights into what they were saying to each other and what they believed and so on. So it's quite a, a useful exercise. Absolutely. So let's start with um, Clement. He was the bishop of the church in Rome, and he was from the late first century. Um, looking into it, he was the third successor from Peter as the bishop of Rome. And uh, the period that he was bishop of Rome was from 88 to 99 AD. So he's way back in the early days and uh, in a very prominent position. So he clearly has a lot of insight to um, give us. So I'm going to take a quote from him. Truly his purpose will be accomplished quickly and suddenly, just as the scripture also testified. He will come quickly and not delay, and the Lord will come suddenly into his temple, even the Holy One whom you expect. Clearly we see a reference to the idea that uh, Jesus will return when we least expect it. So gives us an indication that Christians expected the second coming of Jesus to be imminent at that time. Is there anything else you'd like to share on that one? Uh, yeah, so the, the quote there is from uh, Malachi. And in its original context, the text is clearly about Yahweh. So basically, Clement is taking a piece of text that is clearly about God and saying it describes Jesus. Okay, that's cool. And obviously there's an indication there, even from the earliest days, that the, the word Lord is a synonym for God. Sometimes uh, Muslims deny that, but like we can see that from the very first century, Christians are already using Lord and God as alternative names. Yeah, and that was a long-standing Jewish tradition. People aren't sure exactly when people stopped using the divine name, but it had definitely occurred by this period, so they would always just say Lord instead of saying Yahweh. Yeah, yeah. Um, that would be um, Adonai, I believe. Is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you've got a, another quote from Clement? Yes. Accept our advice, and you will have nothing to regret. For as God lives, and as the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and the Holy Spirit, who are the faith and the hope of the elect, so surely will the one who with humility and constant gentleness has kept without re regret the ordinances and commandments given by God be enrolled and included among the number of those who are saved through Jesus Christ. Through him is the glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Uh, so I chose this passage for a couple reasons. One, 
while it doesn't say this is the Trinity, it it has the Trinity there. It, it's saying God, which in the early church was generally without qualification, was always used of the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. All three of them are there. And then at the end of the portion I read, it says uh, all the glory is given to Jesus, which is a clear claim of divinity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I can't really add to that. I think the the idea that Jesus is included in a Trinitarian setting and that the glory is for to be given to him forever and ever, it's, it can only be interpreted in a Trinitarian way. Um, otherwise, it would be blasphemous to say yes. it. If you're talking about separate gods or if, if you assume that God is just one and yet Jesus has glory, but he's not God, like that's... That's a very strange interpretation. And I think the simple, straightforward interpretation is that the Trinity is being referred to there. I think we're done on Clement. Okay, so Polycarp, Bishop at the Church in Smyrna, a disciple of John the Apostles, John the Apostle even. So this is like literally someone who has learned from John. And uh, this bypasses St. Paul, which is kind of useful because um, very often Muslims say, well, we've learned everything from St. Paul and he distorted things, but actually the apostles were taught a different message. But here we have someone that has heard it from the horse's mouth, literally John, John, who was Jesus's favorite apostle, who lives into the, la the latter part of the first century. So a very good source for us. Definitely. Um, so he writes a letter to the Philippians. This is dated circa 117, so very early. Therefore, if we ask the Lord to forgive us, then we ourselves ought to forgive, for we are in full view of the eyes of the Lord and God. And we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and each one must give an account of himself. And this is in chapter six, uh, verse two. I think that's a really clear cut reference to Jesus as God there. So he's referring to the Lord, the Lord to forgive us. And we are in full view of the eyes of the Lord and God. And then says, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So we have Lord, Lord and God and judgment seat of Christ. And they're equated there. I don't think we can interpret this in any other way. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, who has the power to forgive but God himself? Yet yeah, here, Polycarp is saying that Jesus forgives us. Yeah. And also, I want to point out that the the latter part is a reference to, probably a reference to the Epistle to the Romans by Paul. And I point this out because already here by the year 117, we seem to, it seems to be treat, being treated like scripture. He's saying, you know, this is what you should do. You should forgive others because you'll be judged by God. And then he quotes Paul to back up his point. Yep. And it's, it's shown, you know, the high authority that St. Paul has there already. Yeah. Right. So, you know, that's a side point. I mean, we're not looking yeah. at the, the yeah. canon today, but I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. The other thing I would I would sort of point out as well is the fact that this is at a transition period from a, a church that is very Jewish in character to one that's more Gentile. And we can see that the judgment seat of Moses being replaced by the judgment seat of Christ there. So we see that kind of transition there, even though it's still got those Jewish elements. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so another quote. Sorry, I think it's your turn, isn't it? Sorry. <laughs> I'm pass it over to you. Sorry, my mistake. Now may God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal high priest himself, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, build you up in faith and truth and in all gentleness and in all freedom from anger and forbearance and steadfastness and patient endurance and purity. And may he give you 
a share and a place among the saints. And to us with you, and to all those under heaven who will yet believe in our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, and in his Father, who raised him from the dead. Uh, this is from the 12th chapter of his letter. Uh, I do want to point out that there is a, a manuscript issue, that not all the man copies of the manuscript have the and God portion of it. One, I'm not a, a expert in textual criticism, and two, I haven't looked at any of the manuscripts, so it's unclear to me, and it appeared to be unclear to the scholars which one's original. The whole passage, or I mean that portion of the passage, appears to be a reference to the opening verse of Galatians, which doesn't have and God. So there's two possibilities. One, the scribes understood this to be a reference and quote-unquote corrected the reference and the and God is original. Or the and God was later added by later scribes who, who felt it should be there. Now, I will point out that in numerous other passages in his letter, he uses that same phrase, Lord and God, and there's no textual issues in any of those. So it's not particularly important, but I did want to point that out. Yeah. I think also in the context where Lord is used as a synonym for God, it's it's not absolutely crucial to make the point. But the fact that he has used that phrase elsewhere, it's kind of, it's a mute point. I would say. Yes. I think the other thing there um, is the fact that Jesus is referred to as the eternal high priest, not not just the mortal high priest, but eternal. So that in itself is also referring to the divinity of Jesus. Yeah, and if you look, the he's saying X will build you up in faith and truth, but X is God the Father and Jesus Christ. Wow, yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. you know, he's saying that they, they do the same thing, that they have the same power. So textual issue aside, we don't need that those two words to understand what is being taught in the letter. Yeah, absolutely. It reminds me of a passage in the Gospels where Jesus says that God will, will teach the people. I can't remember the exact location. I think it's in John's Gospel. So th there we have it, building, building up in faith and truth. That is the function of God to teach the people, and uh, Jesus is performing that uh, function. Okay, right. So we move on now to Ignatius, bishop at the Church of Antioch, disciple of John the Apostle. So we have another disciple of John the Apostle. He wrote a series of letters to various churches on his way to martyrdom in Rome. Antioch is a very interesting place to be um, a bishop at that time because it was the place where the Christians first got the name Christians in Antioch. And I believe the word Catholic was also coined there. I think that might be around the same time or a little bit later, but that's, I suppose that's not as important there. And also a number of uh, liturgies were formed and grew out of Antioch. So it was a very vibrant, rich church, not a million miles away from Jerusalem. So it would have been a good place to to pick up the Christian message, I would have thought. Would you like to start us off this time around? Sure. So the, the first passage I selected is from the opening greeting of Ignatius's letter to the Romans. He writes, Ignatius, who is called Theophorus to the church that has found mercy and the majesty of the Father Most High and Jesus Christ, his only Son, beloved and enlightened through the will of him who willed all things that exist in accordance with faith and love for Jesus Christ, our God, which also presides in the place in the district of the Romans, worthy of God, worthy of honor, worthy of blessing, worthy of praise, worthy of success, worthy of sanctification and presiding over love, observing the law of Christ, bearing the name of the Father, which I also greet in the name of Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, to those who are united in flesh and spirit, to every commandment of his, who have been filled with the grace of God without wavering 
and filtered clear in every alien color. Heartiest greetings, blameless in Jesus Christ, our God. So this whole long thing is is one sentence. That's why I read the whole thing. But... <laughs> wow, it is it is a mouthful. <laughs> oh, but in this passage, one he he puts the the Father and Jesus on the same level. They willed things to exist. You know, they're worthy of praise, worthy of blessing, and so on. And twice he says, Jesus Christ, our God. I, I think that's pretty explicit. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, I don't know what he means exactly. Does he <laughs> mean he's a prophet? That's what he really means. He's just a man. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, this is <laughs> if, if we say that the majority of the New Testament was written around the year 70, this is a whole, this is less than 50 years later. So. You know, the, where, where's all this time that this great development took place between the writing of the Gospels and the Church Fathers? I mean, it doesn't seem to be any time for this massive development of doctrine. It seems that you know, the same doctrines that are here and, you know, obviously we say are in the Gospels were there all along. Absolutely. And like John was alive at a time where he would have met Ignatius. So you learn directly from him. So it's it's really the core of the gospel message is, is what he's picked up there. Um, he's in no doubt that Jesus is God as well as a human being as well. I don't think anyone has has said it as clearly as that, you know. It's surprising yeah. that, that the, the various heresies come about later when you have letters like that that are so clear. I don't know if you want to add, add anything to that. I, I'll, nope. I'll give I'll give a quotation here. Um, also from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 7, uh, verse 2. There is only one physician who is both flesh and spirit, born and unborn, God in man, true life in death, both from Mary and from God, first subject to suffering and then beyond it, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Fantastic sentence, that. Absolutely. So you have um, all the complexity that, that, you know, this of God is in that, you know, the being flesh and spirit, born and unborn. It's, it's the ability of God to transcend normal categories, which is just sets God apart, really, from anyone else. Some people like Muslims might say, oh, there's a contradiction. But actually, here is God showing that he's not, he cannot be put in a box. He always goes beyond all our categories, you know, to be born and unborn, to be true life and death. And it's just incredible how, how um, Ignatius has managed to get that in all in one sentence. It's quite a, quite a feat. Yes. And, you know, this while we're talking about the divinity of Jesus, it can't be separated from his humanity. And, you know, it, uh, Ignatius is clearly in line with that. It's, he's not teaching a second God. He's not teaching God pretending to be a man. He's teaching God became man in the person of Jesus. Yeah, Same absolutely. belief we have today. Yeah. yeah. Subject to suffering, so clearly a human being, and but yes, beyond it because of the divinity of Jesus, yeah. That's and should we point out true life and death? Like it's it's clearly saying that, that Jesus died. You know, should should we forget that part? You know, <laughs> the Quran says six centuries later Jesus never died, but here are people who knew what they were talking about, and they make no bones about it. You know that Jesus had died, and yet he was alive again. Very true. It, the uh, crucifixion wasn't added later on. Yeah. Okay. I think that's it's time to move on. Justin Martyr, do you want to introduce him maybe? Sure. So uh, everyone we've looked at so far is a, has been a leader of the church. Uh, Justin Martyr is a little different. He was a convert to Christianity. And after he converted, he began to debate people be what we today would call a Christian apologist. Um, one of his work is called the first apology. Another one's called the second apology. 
he's interesting because he's taking a more um, theological tone to his letters. You know, the the letters we've read so far, read so far, you know, they were occasional. They were written for a specific purpose. So Justin Martyr is writing to defend specifically to defend the doctrines of the church. So if, if we see that his statements seem to be higher theology, well, that's for a reason. He's debating theology. It's not because theology developed. Absolutely, and, yeah. and he also is writing in the mid-2nd century, early to mid-2nd century. So this is still extremely early. This is still less than 100 years after the time of Jesus. Wow, yeah. All right, so the first quote I have is, I have taken great care to prove at length that Christ is the Lord and God the Son, that in times gone by he appeared by his power as man and angel, and in the glory of fire as in the bush, and that he was present to execute the judgment against Sodom. Wow. So a couple interesting things here. Um, he uses the title God the Son. He doesn't say Son of God. And he's as ascribing a number of Old Testament passages or alluding to a number of Old Testament passages and saying these were Jesus. These weren't God the Father. These weren't uh, an angel. This was uh, the pre-incarnate Christ. I think that that's a, a really interesting passage. It is, yeah. I don't know if we can add anything to that. Yeah, so he's making clear that the what's known as the Theophanies in the Old Testament were a pointer to Jesus that there is Jesus being present in the world before he comes into the world in the incarnate form. Interestingly, he's, he's talking about he was in the glory of, of fire as in the bush and, the, you know, the crown seems to um, ignore the bit about the fact that it's that's connected with Jesus. Yeah, and that's that's one of the passages where it says the angel of the Lord did so and so Yahweh did so and so like the same so and so that that they're equivalent that this uh, so called angel of the Lord and Yahweh are one and the same yet different in in some sense so it's it's an aspect of the Trinity being taught in the Old Testament yeah, and one other thing that strikes me is the is the foreshadowing of the, the the wood of the cross in the fire in the bush so you have lots of different symbolic elements in in that. Okay, so we'll move on to another quote. This is from Justin Martin's First Apology, Chapter 13. Our teacher of these things is Jesus Christ, who was born for this end and who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius Caesar. We shall prove that we worship him with reason, since we have learned that he is the son of the living God himself and believe him to be in the second place and the prophetic spirit in the third. Wow, that's, a, that's quite a quote there. Well, the first thing that strikes me about that is that he's trying to show clearly that Jesus was a historical figure. He's not just some myths. He's not some legend. And he's, he's effectively saying, if you want to investigate further, Here's where you go looking for him. Um, it's, a, it's crucified under Pontius Pilate. He says he's procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius Caesar. That, so if you, you go back into your history books of the time, you can quite easily pin down when Jesus lived. And it says, we shall, we shall prove that we worship him with reason. That's quite an interesting phrase. So it's not, um, he's distinguishing the Christian worship from the paganism, which is a kind of an irrational set of beliefs, um, saying that, you know, Jesus is being worshipped with reason, is that it's something objective, it's not just guesswork, they, they have been given an experience of Jesus that convinces them that this is the truth. That's what it says to me, anyway. Yeah, I agree, and playing off that same phrase, he's saying, 
in addition to saying, you know, Christianity is logical, he's also saying we didn't just arbitrarily sick, pick some person and decide to worship him. We have a good reason for doing that. And then he, he tells you that reason. He says that he's the son of the living God himself and that he is in the, the second place and the spirits in the third. So they, again, another reference to the Trinity without using the word. Yes, the word wasn't coined yet. We get that, Muslims. Yeah. You, you don't have to tell us the word Trinity is <laughs> not in the Bible. We know that. It's a description of a doctrine. It's not. Yeah. We don't believe the word Trinity. We believe the doctrine that God is one in essence and three in person, and that those three persons are God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we've already seen it once, and here we see it again in another author. So this isn't a late invention. This is this goes way back. And they're all struggling to put it into words. They're using different ways of saying it, but essentially it's the same idea that's, that's being presented. God is one, and uh, within that Godhead, there's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it's, you know, that's it, really. Okay, um, I have nothing else to say on Justin Martin. Let's move on to Melito of Sardis, who's a bishop of the church in Sardis, and this is on the Passover and it was written around 170 AD. For the law is old, but the word is new. The type is provisional, but grace is everlasting. The sheep is perishable, but the Lord, not broken as a lamb, but raised up as God, is imperishable. For though led to the slaughter like a sheep, he was no sheep. Though speechless as a lamb, neither yet was he a lamb. For there was once a type, but now the reality has appeared. So clearly there, the, the phrase, but raised up as God, imperishable. There's a clear reference to Jesus' divinity. There's the play off of the humanity and the divinity of Jesus in, in the, those uh, what alternating phrases, I would say. Yeah, and just so it's clear... I mean, it, it is clear, but just to be absolutely clear, he got a little while later, he says, this is Jesus the Christ. This is Jesus the Christ to whom the glory forever and ever. Amen. So what he's been describing up until that point. So this, this whole work is kind of like a epic poem, if you will. They, you know, he's using poetic language. He's describing the, the passion event. Yeah, so he goes through all these things that uh, this is the lamb um, and, the, and the portion we read. And then uh, while later he, he says, by the way, this is Jesus, in case you didn't get it. Um, what do you think that phrase, the type is provisional? Are we talking about the foreshadowings in the Old Testament? Is he talking about all the various... Uh, similar kind of ideas that you find in in olden times is that is that what's talking about or yeah I, I think that's definitely what he's referring to um, one of the major themes of the early church fathers is uh, this idea of types and shadows being replaced by the real uh, this of course uh, this phrase of course comes from the New Testament and it was one of the things that all a lot of of the church fathers really keyed in. So by type, he that's definitely what he's referring to. He's referring to the types and shadows of Jesus in the Old Testament. So those things pass away, but then they're replaced by the everlasting grace of Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. There's another quote, if you'd like to take that one. Yep, so this is from much later in the work. He who hung, the earth is hanging. He who fixed the heavens in place has been fixed in place. He who laid the foundations of the universe has been laid on a tree. The master has been profaned. God has been murdered. This passage, obviously, he's still describing Jesus. He's clearly the one who was fixed on the cross, who was hanging on the cross, who was laid on a tree, which is a very common euphemism for crucifixion. Fiction. The Romans really hated to use the word crucifixion. They always used metaphors, hung on a tree, nailed to a tree, that kind of thing. And then he says, 
lest there be any doubt, I mean, he's already said that this is the guy who created the universe, but lest there be any doubt, he says, God has been murdered. When, you, when you murdered Jesus, you murdered God. Yeah. Now, um, that phrase, I'm sure, will cause confusion among some Muslims. They will say, well, you can't, how can you murder God? God is divine. He's immortal. But what we're talking about here is in the person of Jesus, he's he's human and divine. So if you if you if you attack one part of the person, you've attacked the, the whole person. So if, if you kill the body, you've killed the whole person. Obviously, he continues to live on the same as if if we die, our soul lives on. So it's it's um, that's that's how it would be uh, understood. Yeah. And this. Um extremely common objection really betrays a lack of confidence in the their own eternal nature because in both christian and muslim doctrine life doesn't end at the death of the body so why is it problematic to say that god's body has been killed we don't say that a human's body has been killed when we just say he was killed you know, we don't we don't need to specify that we're only talking about the body. So it's not problematic to say just use normal terminology and not make some weird stay. Oh, uh, by the way, we killed Jesus's body. We understand that whether it, it, it's God or it's a human, that the spirit lives on. We don't need to use special terminology. And it's not a contradiction. It's you trying to force the wrong meaning of the term into the passage. Yeah, it reminds me of sheep who that won't go into the box in in a field, you know, and they will avoid going through the gap when clearly, you know, they just need to follow the the natural conclusion. You know? Yes, so I have this image of a sheep dog, which I think is it kind of fits in with a lot of the imagery of the gospels as well. But anyway, yeah, I I totally agree with you there. Okay, so um. Our next person we're going to look at is uh, Irenaeus of Leon. He was a bishop of Lugdunum in Gaul, which is now Leon in France. He studied under Polycarp, who in turn had been a disciple of John the Apostle. So if we compare this with the science of uh, the Hadith, where you have 20 or 30 links, we're talking about someone who's literally just two steps away from one of Jesus' prime apostles. So you have John the Apostle, then Polycarp, and then Irenaeus. So a fantastic um, source. Um, and he writes in 180 AD a piece called Against Heresies. Before I read the passage, a strong argument against the idea that Christians were negligent, and the Bible got corrupted, is the fact that all of these church fathers put 100% of their energy into clamping down on anything that went astray. You know, any sort of hint of a heresy, even if it seems sort of minuscule, they were down on it. They would, you know, write letters and books and everything to try and um, warn the faithful and steer them away from it. You know, I think that's really important to point out. These were very vigilant in protecting the gospel message from day one. They weren't uh, negligent. So here we go from uh, chapter th 3, verse 10. Wherefore also Mark, the interpreter and follower of Peter, does thus commence his gospel narrative. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make the path straight before our God. Plainly does the commencement of the gospel quote the words of the holy prophets and point out him at once whom they confessed as God and Lord. So that's a fantastic passage there. The key thing there that strikes me is when it connects that opening passage, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, with the voice of John the Baptist 
prepare ye the way of the Lord, which would be Yahweh, literally. So it's identifying Jesus with Yahweh, God. It's a, a direct connection there. Yeah, and one of the interesting things about this passage, which why I picked this one as opposed to you know numerous other passages by Irenaeus, he's quoting the, the Gospel of Mark to prove his point. And there's this idea, even in scholarship, that the synoptic Gospels don't clearly teach that Jesus is God, that that was something invented by John. And that's not really the case. What really is the case is that they used language that isn't our language. They made it quite clear that uh, Jesus was God, but they used terminology that made sense in their first century context. In a pluralistic pagan culture, it probably didn't make a lot of sense to say, Jesus is God. The, the response would be, so what? Lots of people are God. Rather, they're making it clear that Jesus is Yahweh. Rather than using a generic term, God, they're referencing specific things that any faithful Jew would recognize as clearly belonging to Yahweh. And Irenaeus, who is familiar with the context, sees that. He says, Plainly, Mark, right from the start, is telling us that Jesus is God and Lord. Yeah, uh, excellent. And the other thing which is quite helpful as well, and he's not the only one to, to state it, is he points out that Mark got his material from Peter by calling him an interpreter and follower of Peter. And Peter, of course, is a key figure who better to get his sources from so it's kind of reinforcing the case that this is an excellent gospel to to base your belief in Jesus as both Lord and God. Yeah, and to go back to the Hadith analogy, here's our chain. Peter, the mark. <laughs> that's that, it, that, boom. <laughs> that's the extent of the chain. That, that, yeah. that's, that's our Hadith, Hadith chain for the gospel of Mark. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 you know, in both cases, very reliable people. For those who perhaps don't know, there is um, an account in the in the early church tradition that Mark's mother was the person who um, held the Last Supper in her upper room. I don't know if you've heard that. Um, yes. So, and the story is also that Mark was the young man who runs away naked in the Garden of Gethsemane. So he himself is highly placed. So. What, a, what an amazing thing to to be in a family who whose um, upper room was used for the Last Supper. And that undoubtedly became a shrine after the, the events. And so he had plenty of opportunities to meet all the key witnesses to everything. What a great place he was in to be able to, to tell that story and tell it well and reliably. You know, there's something that needs to be said, really. Before we move on, um, just an interesting thing with that tradition that about Mark, the vast majority, something like 95% of the stories contained in Mark are repeated in at least one other gospel. But the story of someone grabbing a cloak and a man running away naked is only found in Mark. So... It feels like there's a good possibility that he's adding that to the tradition that he's reporting on from his own experience. Yeah, so he's, it's, it's his way of saying, and I was a, uh, an eyewitness to these events. Yes. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, so oh. the second passage from Irenaeus, this is in uh, Against Heresies. He, did, he does have a number of other works as well. But this is his major famous work. This is from Book 4, Chapter 5. But our Lord is himself the resurrection, as he does himself declare, I am the re resurrection and the life. But the fathers are his children, for it is said by the prophet, Instead of thy fathers, thy children have been made to thee. 
Christ himself, therefore, together with the Father, is the God of the living, who spoke to Moses and who was also manifested to the fathers. And by here, fathers, he means the Old Testament saints. Yep. So he's saying that, I mean, he says explicitly that Christ and the Father together are the living God. And he doesn't say Jesus is a lesser God. He doesn't say Jesus is a created being. He doesn't say Jesus was a man. He doesn't say Jesus was a prophet. He says Jesus is the same God as the Father. That together they are the living God, not one by himself, not two separate beings as two different gods. They're together are one God. Yeah. I don't think I can add to that. Um, I think it's it's interesting the, the word life and living God are both mentioned. So it's, it's this is not a dead doctrine. He's talking about a real living God who, who is Jesus Christ. And the other bit is manifested to the Father. So this is not just some dreamed up idea, but actually something that has been revealed and they are simply accepting this revelation and passing it on. You know, it's something objective, trustworthy and so on. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And he, he seems to believe that this is what Jews always believed, that, you know, maybe they didn't have the proper terminology. They didn't know that he would be given the name Jesus. They didn't know that he would become incarnate in the year 4 BC or whatever. But they did know that God was multipersonal. Yep. Um, so we move on to Clement of Alexandria. He was a theologian and teacher at Alexandria circa the year 200. One of the things I would say about Alexandria, Alexandria is associated with St. Mark. He's, he's um, believed to have set up the church there. And I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know a lot about uh, Clement. I don't know if you have anything extra to say about him. No, I don't really have anything specifically about him to say, but I did want to point out that all these people are coming from different parts of the world. Yeah, uh, yeah. They're not like in this area, say Egypt or Greece, what we'd call Greece, or, you know, Judea, that each of them had their own beliefs. These are all people from different parts of the world. They all seem to be teaching the same thing. Yep. So that's a, a, a strong support for the overall message. That c cuts against the idea of conspiracy. If, if if you have people in different times, in different places, across a broad spectrum of geography saying the same thing, you know? Okay. So he says in the exhortation to the heathen, chapter one, the word then, that is the Christ, is the cause both of our being long ago, for he was in God, and of our well-being. This word, who alone is both God and man, the cause of all our good, appeared but lately in his own person to men, from whom, learning how to live rightly on earth, we are brought on our way to eternal life. I think that's really clear. He, he's, he's key bit there that jumps out at me is, who alone is both God and man? What distinguishes him, if you like, from the other persons of the Trinity is the fact that he has come in in the incarnate form. But he's very much God. And uh, and through him, we are brought on our way to eternal life. So he's basically saying that this is God and who has basically the keys to eternal life. I want to add that this is probably like the, I don't know, I didn't count them, but third or fourth person already who we've seen that says that Christ is pre-existent. But when we looked at <clears throat> Bart Ehrman, he said that didn't happen to the fourth century that they decided that he was pre-existent. So Excellent. he's not exactly uh, being faithful to what the sources say when he makes claims like that. Yeah. Like, I think really, if he's going to make claims like that, he has to elim eliminate every one of these sort of quotes and give an explanation. And if he's just going to ignore them, how reliable is he really? Yeah. No. So I have a, a second quote from Clement of Alexandria. Who then is this infant child 
he according to whose image we are made little children. By the same prophet is declared his greatness, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, that he might fulfill his discipline and his peace there shall be no end. O oh, the great God, O oh, the perfect child, the Son and the Father, and the Father and the Son. The real key part of this one, I think, well, a couple things are key. One, he's saying that the infant Jesus is already God. And uh, there's a heresy that developed at some point, I don't remember the formal name for it, which basically says that Jesus became God at his baptism. I think you know, that be would that be the Marcionist, maybe? Is it, it, um, I'm I'm not saying Marcus, yeah. Okay. I, <laughs> I, I don't recall the name of it offhand. But this idea that Jesus was just a man and then he became God at the baptism as an adult. And here we have Clement saying, No, the infant child is God. And then the second thing that I think is really interesting here is that he takes the time to say the Son in the Father, which you think is sufficient, right? But then he also says the Father and the Son. Now, this is kind of a way of showing that there's no difference. That there's no, if you just said the Son and the Father, maybe you could say that that's ambiguous and he means that the Son is inferior or subordinate to the Father. But then he goes on and says the Father and the Son. So where's the subordination? He's eliminating that possibility. Absolutely, yeah. There's a lot there in, in those few lines. Uh, the image that comes to mind there is he's talking about the son and the father and the father's son. I just imagine two glasses with, with liquid and being poured into each other. It's a great way of saying they're essentially the same mm -hmm. and in, inter, interwined and one and so on. But like, there's a lot of phrases there that indicate that Jesus is God there. Mighty God, everlasting father. It's like Jesus unusually here is referred to as everlasting father even though he is the son perhaps it's explained maybe in the idea that, uh, the father is in the son maybe i'm not too sure but um uh, yeah so this that of course is a, a quote of isaiah 9 yeah which is one of the prophecies of god becoming incarnate so i i think that you know, Isaiah uses that terminology to make it clear that he's talking about the same God. And here we have Clement doing the same thing. He's saying, this is the same God. There's no there's uh, no distinction in, in essence, only yeah. in person. Yeah. yeah. We'll move on to Tertullian. Um, he was a Christian apologist of the late second and early third century. So we're just moving on further in time now. Take the first quote. For God alone is without sin, and the only man without sin is Christ, since Christ is also God. From his treatise on the soul, chapter 41. There we have it. Now, according to the Quran, the only one without sin <laughs> is Christ. So if the Quran is true... That can only mean one thing. The Quran <laughs> says that Christ is God. <laughs> so. I agree. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how these elements of Christian theology made their way into the Quran. And the author apparently, or author and or editors apparently, did not quite understand what they were copying. Because, you know, they, they copy these passages such as saying that Jesus is without sin, and they don't understand that that's a claim of divinity. Absolutely, yeah. So I'll take the next one. Okay, yeah. Uh, this is against, this is from Against Praxius, chapter 9. Bear always in mind that this is the rule of faith which I profess. By it I testify that the Father and the Son and the Spirit are inseparable from each other, so you will know that in the sense that this is said. Now observe, my assertion is that the Father is one, and the Son one, and the Spirit one, and that they are distinct from each other. This statement is taken in a wrong sense by every uneducated as well as every perversely disposed person, as if it predicated a diversity in such a sense as to imply a separation among the Father and the Son and the Spirit. 
So here he's saying pretty explicitly yeah. that Father, Son, and Spirit are one in one sense and distinct from each other in another sense. Over the centuries, the church has come up with many statements of faith, many creeds. I don't think that there's a clearer statement than what we see here already in the late second century or early third about what the Trinity is. And clearly, he's saying that there are people out there who don't understand this, but those are the uneducated people. That's not what we mean when we say that God is three. We don't mean one plus one equals one. We mean three in one sense, one in a different sense. Yeah. And so I wonder which description is he applying potentially to Muhammad there? The, the people who get it wrong are either uneducated or perversely disposed. So take your pick, Muslims. Which, which is it? Um, Absolutely. I think the I think a key thing there is with any revelation, there's a certain expectation of goodwill. If you have goodwill towards the revelation, then you 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 open yourself to to try to move towards an understanding. But if you resist it, if you if you insist on your own understanding, you're never going to even come close to grasping it. Um, you know, so it's not just lack of education. It's if you have a bad will like as it says perversely disposed you're never going to get it you're going to have this wall that's that's um, insurmountable yeah absolutely and i mean this isn't something that's unique to muslims this is something all human beings do that you come to a text with your preconceived notions and then you try to find your ideas in the text rather than reading the text and trying to derive your ideas from the text you know muslims are told that God is absolutely one in all senses. So then when they come to the the Bible and they read that, you know, statements about Jesus being God, they're like, well, this must be a corruption. This couldn't have possibly been in the text. Or less commonly, you're misunderstanding the text. That's not what it actually says. This silly challenge of show me where Jesus said, I am God, worship me. Well, he doesn't have to say those exact words. And if he did say those exact words, you would just say it was a corruption. So why do you want me to show you anyway? Yeah, it's it's not a sincere um, challenge, really, when you say that. Okay, so we'll move on to the next one. Do you want to introduce uh, the next person? whose name uh, I, I can't pronounce. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure the correct pronunciation either, but it's Hippodocus of Rome. Yeah, um, sounds good to me. Yep, he was an early 3rd century theologian. And the interesting thing about him is that he was a disciple of Irenaeus. He was a disciple of Polycarp. He was a disciple of John. So here we have the you know this chain of teaching being passed down, continuing. And we don't just have this chain attached to a, a thing without any evidence. We have the writings of Polycarp. We have the writings of Irenaeus. We have the writings of John. We can check to see if they're all teaching the same thing. And we do indeed see that they are. So the first quote I have is from his work, Refutation of All Heresies. As you pointed out, this is a very common thing for the church fathers to do, write works on refuting heresies. For with the knowledge of self is conjoined the being of an object of God's knowledge. For thou art called by the deity himself. Be not therefore inflamed, O ye men, with enmity towards one another, nor hesitate to retrace with all speed your steps. For Christ is the God above all, and he has arranged to wash away sin from human beings, rendered regenerate the old man. As in a large number of these, there's a very explicit statement that Jesus Christ is God. But he doesn't just say he's God. He says he's God above all. You know, he's the most high God. He's not a lower God. He is the one true God. Absolutely, yeah. The other thing I find interesting is that he attributes the the salvation plan to Jesus. He says, you know, he's arranged this. 
something Muslims like to say is that God is unjust because he made Jesus die on the cross against his will. But here we have uh, you know, an early theologian saying, no, this was Jesus's plan. It wasn't just the Father's plan. It was God's plan. Absolutely. It wasn't an accident. It was always meant to happen. Yeah. Strong sense there of Jesus as God who who offers help to the, the sinner, um, who gives us, prov- uh, how would we put it, who acts with providence towards us, something like that. He provides. Okay, so we're going to the next quote, which is against the heresy of one Noetus, section 17. Let us believe then, dear brethren, according to the tradition of the apostles, that God the Word came down from heaven and entered into the Holy Virgin Mary in order that taking the flesh from her and assuming also a human, by which I mean a rational soul, and becoming thus all that man is, with the exception of sin, he might save fallen man and confer immortality on men who believe on his name. So that is essentially what Christians have been saying all for the past 2,000 years. That could have been said last year. It's like essentially the same message. So Jesus is God, the Word, come down from heaven, and who took flesh from the Virgin uh, Mary, becoming thus all that man is with the exception of sin. So once again, it's it's saying that Jesus is without sin, the one being who is without sin. Clearly, teaching that Jesus is divine. Yep, absolutely. You know, and he says, God, the word came down from heaven. He doesn't say, he doesn't just say the word. So, you know, there's no ambiguity here. And, you know, he's teaching the deity, incarnation, salvific death of Jesus. So, I mean, this is the Christian message in a paragraph. It's not a, a late invention. It's a, it's been there all along. And, uh, you know, even just the the phrase, the Holy Virgin Mary, again, is a further indication that he's not just a product of a, a human father and mother. He's something different. Yes. Even though, you know, that's familiar with to most Christians. That. So we're on to Origen. He was a Christian theologian of the early third century. Whose turn is it? Is mine? I can't remember. <laughs> uh, I'll go ahead and go. Okay. Uh, so uh, this first quote comes from his work to Principis. This is in the preface. He says that there are three essential Christian doctrines. The first one basically describes the work of the Father. The second one, which I'll read momentarily, describes the work of the Son. And the third describes the work of the Spirit. So he's saying the three essential doctrines of the Christian church are the Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh Uh, So on, on Jesus, he writes, Secondly, that Jesus Christ himself, who came into the world, was born of the Father before all creatures, that after he had been the servant of the Father in the creation of all things, for by him were all things made. He in the last times, divesting himself of his glory, became a man and was incarnate, although God, and while made a man, remained the God which he was, and he assumed a body like our own, differing in this respect only, that it was born of a virgin and of the Holy Spirit, that this Jesus Christ was truly born and did truly suffer and did not endure his death common to man in appearance only, but did truly die, that he did truly rise from the dead, and that after his resurrection he conversed with his disciples and was taken up into heaven. So a lot here, obviously. He is laying out the essential doctrines of the church. That it's his stated purpose. He covers everything uh, essential here. He says that you know Jesus was active in creation. He says that he gave up some of his divine attributes in order to become man. That once he became man, he was still God. 
and that then he was born of a virgin and the Holy Spirit. Uh, he was truly born. He didn't just appear to be born. He didn't just show up one day as an adult. And then he did really suffer, and he really died on the cross. And that when he rose from the dead, he was taken up into heaven. Yeah. I, I think th what strikes me about it is, in this case, it's, it's almost like he's assuming that the audience accepts that Jesus is God, but he's trying to convince them that he was really human. In the early days, it was the opposite. They were trying to convince people that he was really God. But here, the, it's trying to get the balance back again that he, Jesus wasn't God with like a phantom body that he was going around and he was I don't know, like a, a superhero that couldn't be hurt in any way. Yeah. Critics, uh, whether they're Muslims or atheists or whatever, often like to point to passages in the New Testament that explicitly say Jesus was a man. And my response is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the, the writers of the New Testament emph sometimes emphasize his humanity greatly, and they do that for a reason. Because it was probably actually a lot easier for people to accept his divinity in the early days than it was to accept his humanity. So, you know, they're making it clear that, yeah, we all know he's God, but he's also human. He really became a human. He didn't just take on the form of a human like the the pagan deities might from time to time. Um, but he actually became one of us. He didn't. He wasn't playing a game. He didn't fake his death. He wasn't acting on the cross, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we'll take the next quote. This is from De Principis. I think it's book one, chapter two, verse 10. For through wisdom, which is Christ, God has power over all things, not only by the authority of a ruler, but also by the voluntary obedience of subjects. And that you may understand that the omnipotence of Father and Son is one and the same, as God and the Lord are one and the same with the Father. Listen to the manner in which John speaks in the Apocalypse. Thus saith the Lord God, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. For who else was he which is to come than Christ? Well, that's quite a strong one there. He's pointing out that Jesus is omnipotent, just the same as God the Father is, that they are one and the same, both God and both Lord. The other thing that strikes me is wisdom is referred to in the Old Testament quite a bit. I think it's Ecclesiastes, book of Ecclesiastes, um, refers to wisdom a lot. And so even that is a foreshadowing of Jesus. Jesus is the, the Logos, the wisdom of God um, becoming incarnate. Yeah, this is um, something that a number of the early church fathers talk about, that wisdom, which occurs in a few books of the Old Testament, was the pre-incarnate Christ. And I like to point this out because this is something that isn't talked about much in the modern church. Maybe we we see wisdom and we, we see that as being personified, clearly. I mean, that there's no doubt about that. But we just kind of gloss over that and say, ah, it's just a literary device. They're just, the author is just personifying wisdom. But the early fathers saw wisdom as the pre-incarnate Christ, which is especially interesting, perhaps, in that the a wisdom of the Old Testament is usually given feminine terms. Yeah. But if we remember back to Genesis 1, God says that I created man in my image, male and female, I created them. So there's nothing odd about that. You know, we, we customarily refer to God in masculine terms, but we understand that God isn't really a man, so to speak. I mean, yes, he became a man in the person of Jesus, but he doesn't have maleness as an essential characteristic. Yeah, he transcends gender in, in a sense. Actually, the phrase that came to mind there when you were saying that is the uh, the line where Jesus says, how I've wished to gather you under my wings like a hen or words to that effect. 
sort of a very yes. feminine sort of image for himself really to have. I would have to double check, but I think he even says a mother hen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So essentially Christ has power over all things, not only by the authority of a ruler, but also the voluntary obedience of subject. So I think it's it's crystal clear there um, what it's saying about Jesus as God. Yeah, and actually I just noticed this um, pointed out. He says, uh, understand that the omnipotence of the Father and Son is one and the same, uh, as God and Lord are one and the same with the Father. So here's, you know, another statement of clearly saying that they're the same, in, at least in some respect. And, you know, the, the power of the Father is not greater than the power of the Son. Uh, they're equal. And then he says, and I know they're the same because they are the same being. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's the logic fo follows from that. That's interesting. Um, the phrase by the voluntary obedience of subjects is is also kind of interesting for me there. Yes, Jesus has all this power of God, but still expects people to obey him voluntarily as well. Mm -hmm. He's he's not a despot. He's very different from the God of the Quran, of which is arbitrary and 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 all you can hope for is to be a slave of Allah. Here uh -huh. is here is a very different um, idea of God where. He wants us to freely choose him, not just be forced to do so. You know? Right. It's saying, you know, he has the authority, but he wants you to voluntarily come to him. Yeah. He could force you, but that does, isn't what he wants. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was very interesting um, this evening. I definitely think Christians could learn an awful lot from the early church fathers as it's a, a it's a good way of looking at the Bible afresh, you know, to see the Bible through the eyes of the very first Christians who knew the apostles, who knew firsthand what was intended by the writers of the Gospels and so on. It's like you can't do better than that, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And being aware of these things also shuts down arguments that you otherwise might not have a good answer for. Someone says that the Trinity was invented by the Council of Nicaea, and you say, no, it wasn't, and then you try to prove it from the New Testament. But, of course, someone who wants to take this kind of position already has answers. They might not be good answers, but they have answers for those passages. But then you can show them things that, from the early church fathers and then show that this belief was already there. It wasn't invented later on. In addition to the Apostolic Fathers, there's also early writings that don't fit neatly into these categories. Like, for example, the, uh, well, I pronounce it the Didache, but I think it's pronounced the D Didache. Would that be how you pronounce it? Uh, yeah, I've heard um, it pronounced multiple ways. But, <laughs> <laughs> but like, um, what was, I was just reading about it this evening that it was lost for, for most of the 2000 years and rediscovered in 1873. And uh, it was found inside a, a codex, and it has the earliest expression of early Christian beliefs and practice, which is very interesting. Um, it's well worth everyone having a read of it. And essentially, it talks about the Christian way as, um, as being sort of the good way which leads to heaven versus the bad way which leads to hell. And uh, and then following from that, it, it, it talks about the essentials in terms of the moral life for the Christian. And uh, and then it talks about baptism, which is quite interesting, because obviously that's a bone of contention for early Christians. But it's very pragmatic, I find, about baptism. It says that if you can find living water, which is i.e. stream, then use that. If you haven't enough water, then just pour water over the over the person three times that'll be enough you know so it doesn't it doesn't be a stick in the mud about it it's a, like it's kind of realistic it's saying look at the key thing is this is be ideal number one if you can if you can go into a stream if 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 you can dunk them dunk them if you can't if there's not enough water then don't let that be an obstacle so you kind of see all the traditions 
of, of, of later Christianity in terms of baptism, all there in that early document. It's quite interesting that Christians chose one or other of those three different overall ways. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, and I, I think this brings up a good point in that Christianity isn't based on formulas or rituals. Yeah, it's the, the document gives advice on how to baptize. And the modern church gives advice on how to do things. But how we practice, how we pray, you know, what position we pray in, um, how we choose to baptize people, that kind of thing isn't part of our doctrine. Yeah, and that's yeah. because, you know, we're not performing a set of rituals. We don't have a magic formula that pleases God. Uh, this is kind of the long-standing tradition of just about every religion, whether it be, you know, an animistic religion or classic polytheism, or even if we're talking about Islam, you do particular rituals and you get a reward for doing those rituals. Absolutely, um, yeah. People performed sacrifices because, well, there was a couple ideas, but basically to please the gods. The one idea was that the gods were incapable of eating on their own, so you had to send food up to them. Yeah, um, yeah. Or, uh, you know, another idea is they just liked the smell of the sacrifice and it made them happy. But either way, you're performing a ritual to get a reward. And, and Christianity is completely different in that fashion, that we know that we can't earn God's favor. We, instead, we, we just place our trust in his grace we say, you know, God, there's nothing I can ever do to be worthy of you. So I'm placing my trust in you, not in myself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's, that's it. I, I, I don't have anything to add to that. Um, I highly recommend people to check out the church fathers. I've attempted to, to read the church fathers, but I, I, I believe it's like three or four million pages. So. <laughs> So it might take me decades to finish it all, but I, I will get back to it. Uh, one church father that kind of finishes the whole period of, of the patris patristics, as it's sometimes referred to, is uh, St. John of Damascus. He really, to my mind, is an excellent um, source to go to because he sums up the entire tradition up to that point so well. But all of these people have uh, great insights to share in terms of how to interpret the Bible and also how to live the Christian life, you know. Yeah, uh, to your point of the Church Fathers, there was a, a work of 18th or 19th century that gathered together every single writing of the Church Fathers, and it was published just the Greek Church Fathers, which isn't even the majority. Yeah, It's like 75 thick volumes. And then the Latin Fathers, it's like 150 volumes or something. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. <laughs> so and yeah, there, there's a lot of material out there. And the, the what, what really amazes me is the fact that every page of that is so dense and, and such high quality theology that you could, you could spend, I don't know, you could spend a lifetime doing a PhD on this one page, you know, and there's millions of these. So it's yes. incredible, really. It's it's all part of the glory of God, you know, that all of this has has occurred over time, you know. Yeah, we don't have a lack of evidence for our faith. You know, we, there's so much evidence that no one could ever master it all. And and that's the you know, that's that's a great thing that you, you know, we can spend our entire lives learning more about God and not learn at all. You know, it, it, you can't just summarize. I mean, you can summarize the essentials of Christianity in a brief talk, but there's so much more depth there. You know, it's the essentials are easy enough that you can grasp them without massive study, but there's so much depth to the scriptures that you can just spend forever essentially studying them. Yeah, absolutely. One thing I would like to add to our discussion is it's just to encourage those who are viewing to subscribe to both our channels, which is always always a great help. 
recent answers is very close to 1,000 subscribers. So come on, everybody. Let's get them there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm way behind you. <laughs> um, so yeah, all, all of your support is really great. And uh, the other thing is, do leave a message below in terms of what you would like us to discuss later. Yeah, I'd love to do another one of these talks looking at a different topic in the Church Fathers. I mean, everything we looked at was the, the deity of Christ centered. You know, sometimes we saw a couple other things in the passage. I did try to pick a diversity of passages. But if I was trying to pick passages that teach the Trinity, I would have picked different passages. It's not like I picked the best possible Trinity packet passages. Yeah. And it's, and it's not actually like I really picked the best possible deity passages either because, you know, I don't I haven't memorized all these <laughs> works and know exactly where to turn. I just yeah. you know, looked at the first few references and yeah. uh, picked uh, picked one to talk about. It. There are many 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 passages in all of these authors that talk about the deity of Christ. It's not like I picked the only passage out of this author that talks about it. Now, some of the brief works, you know, there might not be a huge number of statements, but that's because it's a brief work. It has nothing to do with the the particular person not teaching the divinity of Christ. Just to briefly summarize, everyone we looked at today was the third, early 3rd third century or earlier. We didn't... We didn't cover every single person who wrote in this period, but we didn't skip anyone major either. Every one of the most voluminous writers were captured. I tried to pick a, a diversity of geography, diversity of lit types of literature. You know, you got some that are theological works, some that are occasional letters, got uh, some poetry, all kinds of things to show that every aspect of the church, these things were being taught. The only people who weren't teaching these things are the people who are explicitly condemned as heretics. And someone can use their imagination and say there was just as many people who believed this other thing, but that's all it is, is their imagination. There's no evidence of that. All we really know is that someone got this idea and attracted a large enough following to merit comment. That might be 100 people. You know, there might have only been 100 people who followed this heresy, but because it was a mistake... You know, the fathers cracked down on it. Does it. To argue that all of these heresies that we see cropping up were all equally valid and orthodoxy just happened to win out is ridiculous. We don't have any physical evidence of that. Each heresy is different. They arise at different time periods. Plus, for today's subject, the vast majority of the heretics also believed in the deity of Jesus. The idea that Jesus was fully human, uh, I, I'm sure that you could probably find some heretic in the early church somewhere that believed that. But it wasn't the normal way to develop a heresy. The normal way was you changed the relationship between Jesus and the Father. You didn't deny the divinity of either one, but you changed it in some way. You made Jesus subordinate to the Father, or you made Jesus a second God, or you made Jesus and the Father one God who manifests himself in different ways. But you never said Jesus was just a man, Jesus was just a prophet. So there's really no evidence for the the Muslim belief and the hyper skeptical atheist belief that some Christians believed that Jesus was just a man. Absolutely. And the other thing I would say, if if you were to visually stack up all of these church fathers, you see a continuum. There is no gaps, uh, you know, in the whole time frame. Right. Yeah. The earliest authors we looked at are with Clement is either actually contemporaneously with the New Testament or immediately after its completion. And some of the other early works, which we didn't look at because they're not important works, are also from that time period. And, and they don't teach different things. You know, they have different purposes for writing, so they don't all teach, you know, they're not like carbon. No one took a Xerox and, and yeah. copied their guy's stuff. So they, they do say different things, but they don't teach different doctrines for the most part. 
you know, maybe some, maybe they disagree on some secondary points, but on the essentials, they're all in agreement. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the time that we're living in now, it kind of it feels to me like we're kind of in a sim similar era in that. To me, it, it feels like the another era of heresy, where there's so many disparate views and kind of weird conspiracy theories that have kind of entered theology and so on that we're kind of in a similar age you know there's a lot of confusion surrounding a lot of the key aspects of faith so i think it will probably generate another lot of church fathers in our own time you know that, to challenge all these heresies and false ideas you know yeah I, I think if there's one thing that church history teaches us is that there's always going to be new heretics <laughs> popping up <laughs> But the, the interesting thing with that, just very briefly, is that virtually everyone wants to claim Jesus. Muslims want to claim Jesus. Christians obviously claim Jesus. Sometimes Buddhists say that Jesus was just an enlightened teacher like any other Buddha, because Buddha is just an enlightened teacher. Or, you know, people create their own new religions and they base it off Jesus. Yeah. And I, I think that there's... There's a reason for that. Everyone wants Jesus. But Christianity has the real Jesus. Yeah. And actually, the interesting thing, um, the Monty Python team were interviewed around the time that they did they created the film Life of Brian, which at the time was perceived wrongly, actually, that it was about Jesus. But actually, John Cleese um, said at the time that he was going to write it about Jesus, but when they looked at the story of Jesus, he was such a nice guy. They said, there's no humor in this because everything he taught was something you'd agree with. So the, the, their, their angle was always someone who was a false um, prophet who was mistakenly assumed to be a messiah. You know, uh -huh. that, that was always the joke. But it, it, I think the monty python team were actually very fair to christianity at the time i think you know some people might might disagree but actually they even they who weren't particularly religious could recognize that jesus was uh was someone that you could only admire and not someone that you could um easily just lampoon so. definitely uh so before we go i wanted to say that i am going to try to have a live stream on wednesday I will be interviewing uh, David Garrison. He's the author of a book called A Wind in the House of Islam. Um, it looks at contemporary movements to Christ. That in the history of Islam, there was you know, only isolated converts to Christianity here and there. Uh, voluntary converts, I should say. But in the last 25 years, there's been an explosion of the number of people coming to Christ for so I will be interviewing him if we can if I can figure out how to use the live stream, it'll be live. <laughs> yeah. If yeah. not, I'll it'll be recorded. Yeah, that sounds good. I look forward to that. Okay. Um. So with that, we'll say good night to everyone, and uh, hope you enjoyed the the show. Good night. Good night.